Good morning. I think we're going to get started. Can folks hear me? Uh, are we good? We're live? Okay. And recording. Okay. Good morning uh, to those in the room and to those virtually. I'm so happy to be here for the second day of our two-day conference. I will not give long introductions today as I did yesterday. Uh, you have all heard quite enough from me, I think. Um, but I do just want to give a few reminders and kind of technical uh, issues. Uh, so I understand that there have been some questions about audio from those joining us virtually. And we'd just like to remind folks that the ideal browser is Chrome and that the audio will be better from Chrome. And we will make efforts to speak into the microphones. Uh, thank you, panelists. Um, I do want to remind folks that if you have questions for our panelists, the way to ask those questions is using the HOVA site. For So for those in the room, you can have it on your phone. Um, and you go into attendees and Q and A monitor, which you can search in the is an attendee. And you basically DM or send a message to Q and A monitor. And we are monitoring that and we'll make sure your questions are reviewed for the panelists. Uh, regarding, and, and um, that there are many, as many of you have seen from yesterday, ways to communicate with one another, get to know each other online, use the community boards, um, the message boards, but we, do, we are not enabling the chat. We hope that you will focus and concentrate and listen to the panelists and not um, be using the chat during the panel. Um, I do want to mention a few things about CLE. For those in the room, you absolutely must sign in and out. They're nodding at me and giving me a thumbs up from the table. The table is right there. Um, you have to sign in and out or you will not get your CLE credit, um, but that is all you have to do. For those virtual, you have to submit a form, a separate form for each of the panels that you attend. They are being counted for credit separately. The form is on HOVA in the agenda in that panel. You click on it and you click through and you should, if, if you're having any issues with that, please um, let us know by, by how. How are they letting us know? Okay, you can post in the board to ask the organizers. I'm talking to the people online. I don't even know which camera I'm looking at. <laughs> uh, so yes, yeah, so if there are any issues, but you are downloading that form for each panel to submit for your CLE and you must include the code. The code will be spoken about two thirds of the way through the panel and you put it into the form online. I know this is very wonky and logistical, but I hope I articulated that correctly. Um, uh, finally, I do want to just repeat, and you've heard this several times, but it bears repeating and it's important, our trigger warning. Um, we are dealing once again today with some very um, serious and important issues, but issues which also um, may uh, cause folks to feel triggered if you are. For those in the room, please feel free to take a step outside, look at the beautiful view. Uh, we are in a lovely space. Uh, for those online, please feel free to turn off, walk away, take a breath um, in, that, in those moments. Uh, I am really pleased that we have an entire panel today dedicated to vicarious trauma, uh, which I think all of us can appreciate is very much in the air during these two very intense days diving into these challenging um, issues. So um, I believe I'm looking around at my house people with, is that it for housekeeping? Okay. Um, oh, and just regarding for those of you who are new today, there are community guidelines posted on HOVA. If you'd like, please take a look at those. There is also an area of the HOVA app that's dedicated to um, vicarious trauma and resources should you need any resources. Okay, um, moving on to our agenda today. I'm so honored to introduce Mylan Dennerstein. 
a board member at Sanctuary for Families and our host in this gorgeous and amazing space today here at Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher's New York office. Here, Mylan is a litigation partner, chair of the Pul public policy practice group, which is a tongue twister, <laughs> global chair of the firm's diversity committee and co-partner in charge of the New York office. Mylan has been a public servant for most of her career, serving first as a federal prosecutor in the Southern District of New York, and ultimately as deputy chief of the criminal division, and then as deputy commissioner for legal affairs for New York City's fire department. This year, Mylan was appointed to serve as the independent NYPD monitor who oversees the ongoing reform process necessary reform process that was originally ordered by federal judge Shira Shingland in 2013 when she ruled that New York NYPD's stop and frisk policy was unconstitutional. We are so grateful to Mylan for co-chairing Sanctuary's own board advocacy committee and for cultivating the firm's pro bono relationship with Sanctuary. The firm regularly contributes over a thousand hours of pro bono service to Sanctuary every year. It is my pleasure to introduce Mylan Dinnerstein. Uh, good morning, everybody. I will be incredibly brief because um, you have a lot of important work to do. Uh, so one, um, it's an honor to have all of you online and all of you here at Gibson Dunn. It is our pleasure to host all of you because you're doing such important work. Um, and we really value all of your contributions. So thank you for allowing us to have you join us at Gibson. Um, to one little reminder, there is food on the other side. Um, please don't let it go to waste, eat it. Um, so if you need food, which is my comfort, um, um, thing, um, please go out and eat to your heart's desire. Um, what I would like to say as a, what I know about, um, what I'm so excited about, about this conference, and I know you all heard from Judge Weber yesterday, and you're going to hear from Judge Mendelson today, is the idea that everybody's engaging to make things better, um, and recognizing that bias, um, which is real, um, really can impact negatively um, people of color and certainly uh, people who identify as women or, or identify as something other than what's gender conforming. Um, so I think it's really terrific that you all are here. And I was talking to Jennifer before, and I think what I'm most excited about is two things. One, I think a topic that we all need to focus more on is self-care and preservation. And so I'm so excited you're gonna be spending time on that and really excited to hear about strategies and how better we can all manage these very traumatizing situations. And second, I'm so excited there's an advocacy element because this is such a great opportunity having everybody together to come out with uh, uh, directions and things that we can all work on together to make the system better for the future. Um, because ultimately that's what it's all about, um, is we don't want things to continue as they are. We want them to get better um, so that people feel like they are actually getting their needs met and being treated fairly. Um, uh, I love sanctuary. Um, in one of my roles, I actually was, I would say not opposite them, but had the pleasure of negotiating legislation against Dorchin. And if you guys know Dorchin, that is no small feat. Um, and I remember her telling me, Mylan, you're not doing enough. And um, it took me a weekend because sometimes it's hard to hear the truth um, to process that. Um, but then I came back and we did more. Um, and, and that's what it's all about. Uh, and so I really commend all of you for taking your time to be here and to participate and to be present. And again, just thank you to for allowing Gibson to be a small, small, teeny part of this. So I hope you have a wonderful day and a wonderful weekend. And I'm very happy it's Friday. 
Okay, great, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all and good morning to those that are also participating with us virtually. My name is Angela Yaboa, and I am the Advocacy Services Program Manager for Fairfax County's Division for Domestic and Sexual Violence Services in Fairfax, Virginia, and I will be your moderator. Okay, I'm already, everyone must speak into the microphones. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> you have so many important things to say. I just Is it to, on? It is on, <laughs> but it just, it's not, and it needs to be picked up by the, by the audio. Okay, I got so it. Please pull them closer to you. All right. Just, Michael, pull it closer to you. <laughs> We're off to a great start. <laughs> Again, I am your moderator today for what I know will be a robust conversation on um, intimate partner violence, custody cases involving safe child safety concerns, as well as parental alienation. I'm, I'm excited to introduce you all to a dynamic group of panelists today, and I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce them, but I also encourage all of you to take a look at their bios in the HOVA app. So first we have Joan Meyer, who is appearing virtually. There she is. Perfect. Joan is the National Family Violence Law Center Professor of Law at George Washington University Law School. In addition to her decades as a clinical professor and practitioner at GW, Professor Meyer has conducted groundbreaking research on the intersection of abuse allegations and custody proceedings. Next, we have an amazing young woman, Ali Cable, survivor and founder of the Youth Advocacy Initiative at the Center for Judicial Excellence Youth Speak. And I would also like to add in her spare time, she is a third year undergraduate student at NYU studying neural science on a pre-med track. Next, we have Michael Shears. Michael is the director of Domestic Violence Project at Lawyers for Children, where he leads an interdisciplinary team that ensures children's voices are heard while also helping families repair harm and heal. And then we have Kara Bellew. Kara is a partner of Rao. LLC, who has been practicing exclusively in the field of matrimonial and family law since 2005. And last but certainly not least, appearing virtually, we have the Honorable Anne Marie Jolly, who has sat on the family court bench for over a decade, presiding over family law cases and currently serves as the administrative judge of the New York City Family Court. So welcome to our panelists. Um, I would like to begin with Professor Joan Meyer. Joan, you conducted a first of its kind study from George Washington University, which looks at how mothers who report domestic violence or child abuse often lose custody or contact with their children. Can you share with us what led you to do this research and then walk us through the research itself? Excuse me, sorry about the muting. I'm happy to do that. I'm just, you, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I'm just uh, wrestling with uh, share slides to make sure that I can turn this into a slideshow. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, yeah, so I had been, um, working at DB Leap that I had founded Domestic Violence Legal Empowerment and Appeals Project. And I had founded it just to work to, to provide a resource for appeals in the domestic violence field. And I was really hoping not to do a lot of work on custody because it's so painful. <laughs> but everything that walked in the door basically was custody. And over many years, we saw thousands of cases that um, were incredibly troubling. And um, over time, uh, while we did, um, you know, we did trainings and I did scholarship and we did everything we could to try to tilt what was going on in the courts that was so destructive to children and, and protective parents. Uh, it became clear to me that nobody really believed what we were trying to say, which is that this pattern existed. And I wanted to um, see if the data bore out what we were seeing experientially. And I hoped that if we got the data, uh, and it did bear it out that that would help the, the larger world, the courts and policymakers to understand what was really happening in courts. 
So I was able to put together a social science team. I'm going to skip these just for the sake of time. And um, uh, I was very fortunate to get the perfect people on this team. And we put in a grant to the National Institute of Justice and it was awarded. Would you like me to go on, Angela, and talk about the um, how we did the study? Yes. Okay, so so in order to get a national picture, the only way to do that was to look at opinions that were filed online. It's not possible to go to every courthouse in the country and find out what's happening in cases. And by the time we did the study, we were very fortunate that pretty much all appeals are published online and even in state courts. Of course, trial court opinions are not typically published online and I'll come back to that in a minute. But we were able to get, we, we searched for every electronically published court opinion within this 10-year time period on the slide. We uh, narrowed it down to private custody cases, meaning parent versus parent, uh, involving abuse and alienation claims. They could be claims brought by anyone against anyone in the case. And to our horror, we got over 15,000 cases <laughs> with that search. It was a very thorough and careful search uh, to make sure that we matched state language for, their, for how they define DV, et cetera. We narrowed it down to over 4,000, and we and our two soldier coders, who were both law grads, uh, spent over a year triaging and coding all of these cases. Um, and I'm only going to talk to you about a tiny fraction of um, what we coded. We still haven't analyzed everything because we've been quite overwhelmed with everything that we did. Um, that we did uh, at the most at the highest kind of most highlight level. There's a lot of other questions that we want to explore as well. Should I go on, Angela, with the contents? Yes. Okay. I'm looking forward to hearing more. <laughs> okay, so just stop me if you want to interrupt me as I go ahead, okay? <laughs> um, so the, the time limits are extreme here. So I'm doing three very brief things. One is I'm talking about um, what we found in terms of how often courts credit or accept mother's abuse claims and also how often they removed custody from a mother alleging abuse. We talk about um, uh, some interesting gender findings, and we talk briefly about what we found in terms of the impact of guardians ad litem and, and custody evaluators. Okay, first, in terms of um, you know, how often mother's allegations of abuse were believed, we found even more stunning results than I had expected, which is that less than half the time were mother's partner violence claims, which I call DV, where they believed, only 45%. Child physical abuse was credited less than a third of the time, 29%, and sexual abuse less than one-fifth of the time, 15%. And this is in cases that we call pure abuse cases, where we, to our knowledge, as best we could tell, there were no alienation cross claims. This averaged out to courts accepting mother's reports of father's abuse in the family, less than half the time, only 41%. And of course, it shows that courts are far less likely to accept child abuse claims than partner violence claims. Now, when you move on to the cases with cross claims, so mother alleges abuse, father claims alienation by the mother, what happens? And what we found was that those cross claims dramatically reduced the rate at which courts accepted abuse claims, especially child abuse, averaged out to 23%, whereas before it was 41%. So DV is now 37%, child physical is down to 18%, and child sexual was down to 2%, which re reflected one case out of approximately 50 cases. So again, when the father cross-claims alienation, um, courts are far less inclined, roughly half as inclined, to believe mother's abuse claims. And then I have a couple slides that sort of show those comparisons visually. Um, and again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to dwell on these. What um, that can be translated into is, is that an alienation cross claim reduces the likelihood of any abuse allegation by a mother being believed, reduces it by a factor of two, and reduces the likelihood of child abuse being believed by a factor of almost four. I do take one moment here to just contrast what courts are finding with what past studies have found about child sexual abuse claims um, in custody litigation. So only one claim out of 51 was believed when alienation was cross-claimed. But studies that have been done, including very large studies, especially in Canada, but also in the U.S., have found that, I mean, and, and a range of studies, some very small ones, some larger ones, have found that 50 to 73 percent of child sexual abuse claims that are made even in the custody of context, 
custody litigation had been considered to be likely valid. And these studies relied on the views of evaluators and uh, child welfare agents, none of whom are particularly objective or particularly um, necessarily particularly expert, contrary to what we would hope. But, but even with a fairly skeptical population of assessors, they were much more willing to believe child sexual abuse than courts have been. Okay, so moving on to mother's custody losses. Um, we defined this very narrowly because we didn't want to get into arguments that we were, you know, tilting our findings. So we said only, we're only looking at cases where mothers started with the kids. They may or may not have had a legal order, but they started as primary caregiver for the kids. And then at the end of the case, father was awarded primary physical custody. It's just focus on physical here. And what we found was, again, in the pure abuse cases without the alienation cross claims, the mothers were on average losing custody to fathers they alleged had committed some kind of abuse roughly a quarter of the time. Not great, but not, you know, off the charts. Now, when alienation cross claims are thrown in, that again skyrockets to average out at half the time. So mothers' odds of losing custody go way up, um, and about half of mothers do lo lose custody if they allege child abuse and the father responds with an alienation cross claim. A little bit less dr drastic when they're just alleging partner violence. Again, here's the visual that contrasts what happens in cases with alienation claims. And this time the longer bars are the losses of custody. Um, and the blue bars are the not losses of custody. Uh, sorry, the blue gray bars are with an alienation claim. Blue bars are when there's not an alienation claim. And you can see the difference in impact when there is an alienation claim. Again, this translates into um, the finding that fathers have almost three times the odds of taking custody from mothers alleging any kind of family abuse um, when they allege alienation than when they do not. So again, your, your odds, if you're a father accused of abuse, your odds improve by a factor of three if you cross-claim alienation. Now, interestingly, even in cases where father's abuse was confirmed, that is, as I said earlier, it was credited by the court, court believed it happened, 13% of the time, um, custody was still removed from the mother and given to the abusive father. Mostly, well, I can't say mostly partner violence. None of these cases were child sexual abuse, which is good news and not surprising that if a court finds a father as a sexual abuser, they're not giving him custody. But these cases where I think it's possible there, there could be any number of reasons why a mother was seen as unacceptable, even though a father was abusive. Um, the big one being probably that she's an alienator or seen as one. Um, but anyway, that's a fair number of cases in which mothers proving abuse by a father are losing custody. Okay, moving on quickly to the gender findings. Uh, three key findings. One is that we were able to find that alienation's power as a claim is gendered overall. Um, that is that it's an effective defense for fathers accused of abuse, but not for mothers accused of abuse. We had enough cases to do that comparison. We did also find, interestingly, that alienation's power was not as clearly gendered in the non-abuse cases. So in that setting, we found that the impact of proven alienation was remarkably equal for fathers and mothers. I'll come back to these a little more here. Um, so the idea that alienation claims are more powerful for fathers, what we found was that looking at all alienation cases, mixing abuse or non-abuse cases, when fathers accused mothers of alienation, they took custody away 44% of the time. When mothers accused fathers of alienation, and there was a significant number of those, they took custody in only 28% of the cases. So mothers have twice the odds of losing custody to the fathers compared to fathers when accused of alienation. So that's a pretty clear gender bias there. Not too surprising in terms of the history of the, the theory of alienation. Okay, now when you have abuse and alienation, what we found was that um, when mothers allege child abuse, mothers' custody losses, the regression analysis predict that they will increase from 32% without an alienation claim to 52% with an alienation claim. And regression analyses are a little different than all the other numbers I've just been giving you, but they're a little bit more um, neutral, statistically predictive than the other numbers I've been giving you. But we found at the same time that when fathers accuse mothers of any type of abuse, and the mothers cross-claim alienation, it, has, it had no effect on the frequency of fathers losing custody. 
So that's a clear gender bias, again, when you have these cross abuse and alienation claims. Now, really interesting gender parities or possible gender parities. First of all, we found that when a court decides that a parent is an alienator, fathers and mothers get are equally penalized. They, they lose custody at very, very high rates. Um, there are a lot of ways to explain that, but I won't go into that now. Um, and secondly, in the cases where we did not see an abuse claim in the data set that we had, which was court opinions, um, we did not get a statistically significant gender difference. It looks like um, fathers are doing better than mothers, losing custody significantly less. It looks like, I'm using that in a lay sense, um, than mothers who are losing it at 39% compared to 28%. But this is not a statistically significant difference because we didn't have enough cases where fathers start with the kids to get statistically significant results on this. All right, so the way I summarize the, the, what we found about alienation is that it actually supports everybody to some extent. For instance, it definitely supports the critique that the abuse field has been leveling, which is that alienation in cases with abuse seems to be gendered and very powerful in denying mothers and children's claims of abuse and in taking custody away. But the relative gender parity in the non-abuse cases, as well as in abuse cases where courts believe alienation, also support the argument that a lot of alienation professionals make that alienation is not just a gendered claim and it's not just an abuse claim, and it's something that women allege against men because men are alienators too. So this is a lot of the argument we hear in the field and in the literature and among experts that the abuse critique is false because alienation is, is gender neutral, everybody does it, and women are victims of it. Yes, we can confirm that. And it's also true what the abuse field is saying, that alienation is a very powerful weapon against abuse claims. Um, and I just wanted to throw in that obviously most of my clients at DV Leap have been mothers, but not only. And um, I've seen fathers in these cases go through pretty much the same dynamic that I've seen mothers go through. Okay. Lastly, what do we find about GALs and evaluators? What we call GALs, I think in, in New York, you've got Council for Children. Um, and I'm realizing what your immediate question is gonna be, which is what do we find about Council for Children? And I think in these data, um, we, most, we actually mixed, and I know that's a little sloppy from where you sit, but I think we mixed Council for Children and Guardians Ad Litem who were doing best interest because most states don't use Council for Children and the data were too small to really parse them out. So um, what we found was when there was what we call a GAL in the case, mothers alleging abuse were three to five times more likely to lose custody. And that was an especially strong finding when they were alleging physical child abuse or mixed physical and sexual child abuse. Um, we found no statistically significant impact on fathers, protective fathers, likelihood of losing custody. So fathers claiming a mother's abusive were not um, in any way penalized by the presence of a GAL, but mothers absolutely were. We found the same thing with custody evaluators, roughly. Slightly different range, 2.4 to 6.5. The higher range of custody losses with evaluators in the case occur when mothers allege, again, physical child abuse or mixed physical and sexual child abuse. And we found the same thing, that there was no statistically significant impact of the presence of an evaluator on protective fathers' likelihood of losing custody. Um, so it's pretty clear from these data that these neutral court professionals are putting a heavy thumb on the scale against mothers. Um, at least that's how we, we see our data, our findings. Um, and, it, and it comports with what we've felt we've seen experientially. Now I need to end by saying what our limitations are, which is important. First of all, we didn't, we have no way of second guessing what courts found or did um, because we're not looking at the facts and we can't, we can't know the facts. Um, what we're saying here is only what courts are doing and what they're finding. Uh, the question of whether that's wrong is a separate question and there are ways to discuss it, but the study doesn't prove anything about that. Secondly, because the data set was based on court opinions, because that was the best way to find out what was going on, and even though we were only looking at trial courts, what trial courts had done, the opinions, the data source were mostly app appellate cases. 
um, which may not be fully representative of trial of what's happening in trial court decisions that are not appealed. Um, and however, just going down to the asterisk, what we did a brief initial comparison between the several hundred trial court opinions that came up in our in our um, search. Um, and what we found, not surprisingly, was that the rates of custody losses were lower in the cases that didn't go to appeal, which makes sense because moms who lose custody are more likely to appeal. Um, but we did find that the rates of rejection of abuse claims, the crediting data, were not different from what we were finding in the cases that went to appeal. Um, and then our last limitation is that because is again a product of our data set, which is court opinions. We can only know what was in the case based on what the judge wrote in their opinion. And sometimes there are allegations that kind of fall out by the time the judge writes the opinion, such as abuse claims or alienation claims. If the court decides there's nothing to it or forgets about it because there's a much larger issue in the case, it may not show up in the opinion and we wouldn't know it was in the case. So when we distinguish between cases that were abuse cases or not abuse or alienation cases or not alienation, we're going on what's in the opinion. It's possible that's not a perfect reflection of claims that were in the case, but I have, I, I believe that actually strengthens our findings rather than weakening them. But I just want to put that out there uh, to, to uh, contextualize all of our findings. So that is it for me on the findings. I hope I didn't go way too long. No, you did just fine. Thank you, Joan. I'm I'm actually really glad that you brought up the limitations of um, the research because one would argue that they were just opinions that you looked at, right? The data or the research didn't necessarily look at the validity of the claims or analyze the veracity of the claims that were being alleged. And so I can see some critics saying, well, we don't completely have the entire picture. You're just re, you know, re, re basing everything off of court opinions. And it's plausible that some of these allegations could have been false. Yep, yeah. that is correct. And so the question that, and this is what I've always hoped this, these findings would lead us to, but it hasn't happened. The next question is, are women lying 99% of the time when they allege sexual abuse? Mm -hmm. Are they lying 85% of the time when they allege, or I'm, I'm throwing I'm throwing out numbers that may not be exactly right, but are they lying roughly four-fifths of the time when the, they allege child physical abuse, and are they lying over half the time when they allege partner abuse? That is where the debate should be joined. How often are women lying? Now, as a DV specialist, I don't think they're lying anywhere near that often. I'm not saying never, but those numbers to me have nothing to do with reality, but we can have an honest debate about that. But that debate has not happened because the folks that know about my study have either ignored it deliberately because it hurts their industry, which is basically the, the cottage industry that um, uses alienation in court, um, or um, they they don't like the findings and they don't and they um, so they just dismiss them out of hand. But they're not really engaging the question, which is, are women lying this much? Occasionally, you can get someone to say, yes, they're all lying this much, and I'm like fine, let's discuss that. Let's look at the research. Let's look at what we know. How do you know they're lying? You know, let's have that debate because it all boils down to that. But I think basically the field that, that is being criticized by this, implicitly criticized by the study, has been very resistant to having an honest debate about that core question, how often do women lie, versus men who are accused of abuse. Thank you, Joan. Um, so what Joan just um, spoke about is illustrative of what Ali, our next speaker, um, experienced as a subject child in a protracted custody case. I think that so much of what Joan mentioned um, is relatable to your experience. And so Ali, would you like to take this time to share with us your experience? Sure, of course. Um, hi everyone, my name is Ali and today I am speaking as a survivor of the family court system and of a reunification camp called Family Bridges. When I was 16, my sister Kate and I were kidnapped from a courthouse in Kansas, separated and transported to a remote city in Montana where we were held captive in a hotel and threatened into a relationship with our abusive father. Um, this is a short narrative I've written about my story. When I was young, or, sorry, I was young when my parents were together, but I still remember lying awake at night listening to my parents fight. My mom worked so hard to the point that she was constantly sick and had to have her tonsils removed. My father, on the other hand, refused to work. 
He was home every day, but we still had a full-time nanny whose main task was to keep me and my younger sister away from our father's home office, where he would talk with his friends and play solitaire. When my parents told us that they were getting a divorce, I was relieved. Their fighting had always given me anxiety, and I was excited for them to live under different roofs so that I wouldn't have to carry that burden. I quickly realized that my father had transformed into a different person. He became vengeful, and his hatred for my mother only grew. Our first custody arrangement was 60-40, but my father manipulated and guilt-tripped me until I asked our guardian ad litem for 50-50. This behavior only escalated as time went by, and my father waged a war against my mom using my sister and I as pawns. He told us that our mom didn't care about us because she worked, that our mom loved our stepfather more than us, and that our mom was going to hell for divorcing him. When my mom remarried and moved to the Na- to Nashville at the end of my second grade year, my sister and I expressed to our guardian ad litem and therapist that we wanted to move with her. Our father's anger boiled over and he began to physically abuse us and sexually abuse me. He was losing control and it could only be recovered by wielding against us his physical dominance. Multiple court-ordered custody evaluators determined that my sister and I should move to Nashville with our mom, but the court ignored the recommendations of each one. When the guardian ad litem and our therapist finally told my sister and I that we were not allowed to move with our, with our mom, I panicked. For years, I had been silent about the abuse that I endured, not wanting to get my father in trouble, but I couldn't stand by while the court condemned my sister and I to live with our abuser. So I told them. At first, our guardian ad litem would not address our abuse. She said that sometimes we have to do things we don't want to do. And then she straight out told me that I was lying. A year and a half later, my sister and I finally escaped our father's reach after flying back from a weekend visit with our mom. We decided we had enough of sitting idly by while the court allowed our father to abuse us. We forced them to listen, waiting in the terminal until airport security came to collect us and reported our experiences. That was the first and one of the only times my experiences were not just completely ignored in favor of the narrative my abuser meticulously controlled. We ended up staying with a family friend for the school year, and our mom flew back and forth from Nashville to see us. For more than a year, we refused to see our father. I thought the court would finally listen to me and would right their wrong, but that summer we were forced into daily reunification therapy with our father and had no contact with our mom. When my sister and I refused to go home with our father, the case manager for our custody case came came to threaten us. He told us that if we kept lying about our abuse, that my sister and I would be separated and sent to foster care or juvie. He smiled as he described how we would be strip searched and deprived of our belongings, all because we refused to live with our abuser. We ended up couch surfing for the remainder of that summer and finally when school started again, we were able to stay with a family friend. We spent another year in weekly court-ordered reunification therapy with our father's personal therapist, who told us to sweep our abuse under the rug because that's what he did when he was assaulted by his Cub Scout leader as a kid. I thought that the court would give up and let my sister and I live in peace, but then they ambushed us by ordering a forced reunification camp. My sister and I were separated at the courthouse, loaded into different cars. Two strangers drove me. They kept me in the dark, careful not to reveal any plans in their superficial conversations. I didn't know where we were going, if I would eat, or if I would see my sister again. For years, I had been silent. I was afraid to disrupt the peace and possibly hurt someone I cared for. But sitting in the back of the car, the doors child locked as they shut behind me, stripped of my possessions and people I loved. They regarded me as a criminal. They treated me like I was in the wrong for speaking out against my physically, sexually, and emotionally abusive father and the court who supported him and his actions. The next day, we were flown to Bozeman, Montana and taken to the Come On Inn and escorted to a conference room. The door was closed, the windows covered, but a placard to the right of the doorframe read Family Bridges. When the door finally swung open, I looked up across the room to see him. He'd won back the custody of his daughters who were kidnapped and trafficked across the country to appease him. This told me that the court would never hold our father accountable for his destructive, abusive actions. We were told in no uncertain terms by the workshop leaders that we were at the program because our mom had alienated us from our father. Everyone in the room refused to acknowledge that his own harmful actions had deterred us from wanting to spend time with him. 
They informed us that we would not see or speak to our mother for a minimum of 90 days. We'd first complete a four day long education and parental alienation and then continue our rehabilitation in Kansas where we'd be forced to live with our abuser. They didn't care to call this what it was, reprogramming. When I told them through the tears streaming down my face that our father was abusive, that I was terrified of what he would do if we were left alone with him, one of the workshop leaders, a licensed therapist, looked me dead in the eye from where she was sitting across the conference room and told me that whatever happened in the past didn't matter. She told me that the years of abuse that my sister and I had endured, which had been confirmed only months earlier after an investigation by a Kansas detective, were not real, and we weren't allowed to talk about it anymore. When we peacefully but stubbornly refused to cooperate, the camp leaders threatened to separate me and my sister Kate. They threatened to send us to psychiatric hospitals, wilderness camps, and foster care. They threatened that we would see neither each other nor our mom until we each turned 18. We would have to start new lives in different parts of the country, all because we refused to live with our abuser. We stood our ground, hoping to God they were bluffing, but then they forced us to write a letter to our mom. To this day, I can't think of more painful words. We were told to explain to her within a single page that we chose to abandon her instead of, and be sent to some facility instead of submitting to their reprogramming and our father's abuse. This was never a choice. The tears flowed down my cheeks, unhindered by my, de my desire to stay strong and exude confidence because I was not strong anymore. I felt in that moment that stretched long the weight of my decision. I saw my shaky words on the page and I imagined my mom reading them. I wouldn't be there to ease the pain when realization set in and I could only imagine the worst. At the time, I believed with my entire being that they would make good on their word and I was scared. We eventually lost our battle against fear and let, let it take hold of us. We didn't sleep, but exhaustion made it easier to feel numb and feeling nothing was easier than feeling anything. We went back to Kansas to live with our father where the abuse continued, only this time we were threatened into silence. We would, be, we would be punished with an extension of the no contact order if we deviated from their narrative and this reality hung over our heads and forced us to fake happiness and compliance in order to survive. We had to maintain the facade, pretend that the program had been effective. We had to condemn our mother. It was exhausting and I often struggled to imagine a future that I was a part of. It was seven months before we were able to speak to our mom again, but even then we were still not safe. What motivated people to turn a blind eye to mine and my sister's suffering, I will never know, but no reasoning will ever justify the hurt that we felt and continue to feel because the people who were supposed to protect us wouldn't. Before this experience, I would have never believed that the family court system would condone and encourage my abuse, much less participate in their own form. My sister and I were kidnapped, trafficked across the country and threatened into our abuser's home all while court officials ignored our abuse and made money off of catering to our abuser. Immediately after I turned 18 and left Kansas to live with my mom in Nashville, I began speaking to reporters and sharing my story. I came to Center for Judicial Excellence in August of last year, wanting to do more with my experience, and our director, Kathleen Russell, offered to help me start what is now our youth advocacy initiative, CJE Youth Speak. We provide support for survivors of family court crimes and are working to end reunif forced reunification camps through advocacy and legislative action. In addition to running CJE Youth Speak, I am also a full-time undergraduate student at NYU studying neuroscience, but everything that I am and have and will accomplish is despite my father, the court and family bridges, not because of them. Protecting abusers in family court is not acceptable, and family bridges and reunification camps like it must be stopped and brought to justice. Thank you. I'm always in such awe of Allie and the resilience that you've shown, and you're right despite everything, you've emerged stronger and you're using all your talents to help others. And I'm so privileged to share this space with you. I truly am. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Michael, <laughs> how do we transition? <laughs> I mean, as an attorney representing children, 
you know, listening to Ali's story, what are your thoughts? Can, can you share with us your role as an AFC? I'm sorry to put you on spot like this, but. Hey, um, thank you, and Ali, thank you. Um, I'm honored to be here with with you, with you all. Um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Judge Shelley's up in the air there, not with us here, because uh, I wanted to look to her at one point when I speak. Um, first of all, I don't know what to say, and I have <laughs> pages of notes, because there isn't really anything to say that um, that can in some way change, make up for the, the horror of what you just described, and the horror that, uh, um, it's just horrifying. I can't think of another word. Um, so I want to pause for a second, and then I'm going to look down at my notes, and I will have something to say. <laughs> um, so um, I, I think the the power of courts is awesome and can be a power of incredible positivity and. and and that can change lives in a good way. And uh, again, I'm sorry to tell you, but I can't look at you directly. I see you over there. Um, uh, and I'm speaking to Judge Jolly and to other awesome judges that are out there. Um, and I think those of us who practice in this area have had the honor of being able to appear before judges who understand the awesome power that the courts have, especially the courts we're appearing in, um, and uh, and strive to use that power uh, for some something akin to justice, as close to justice as we can get in a, a painfully flawed system that I have to say is massively under-resourced and massively overtasked. So um, that's the best I can do for a quick reaction. I'm I'm uh, I'm horrified by it. Um, so I, I want to use it as a way to center my thoughts in thinking about every day. Uh, a, for me, what a privilege it is to represent children. Um, I'm, uh, I'm honored to get to do that. Um, and also what an awesome responsibility it is uh, in not such a different way that the awesome responsibilities that the courts have. So um, I wish Ali had had a lawyer um, and not a GAL. Um, the GAL system is awful. Uh, and Jones research has, I think, shown one of the awful flaws of GAL systems, any system that doesn't actually have a lawyer that follows the rules of ethics. Rule 1.14, uh, clients with diminished capacity, uh, children are considered diminished capacity, although we know that that's not really what they are, but um, the rules are really clear for all the lawyers in the room. You all know that rule. Um, and did we need a chief judge rule in New York, uh, rule 7.2 in New York to tell us what the, what rule 1.14 1, 1 of the ethics code said? No, if we, if we could open the ethics rule, we knew exactly what it was and we knew what our responsibility was to advocate, uh, for, for our clients' wishes whenever they can be expressed. And sometimes they're expressed in words, other times they're expressed in different ways. Uh, right, so we have young clients who can't always say what they want, but there are ways to to divine what they want from what what they're doing, how they're reacting to people. Um, a great ad for an inter interdisciplinary law practice. Not only do we need lawyers, not GALs, uh, guardians of litem. Who wants a guardian of litem? Uh, and can I just say one other thing about guardians of litem? Um, when we think for of someone who didn't have much to say. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I mean, um, as adults, if you get a guardian of litem, you have entirely lost your voice, right? Um, is there any way that a guardian ad litem is a good thing for someone who's competent as an adult? Please tell me that there isn't, right? There is no no way that it's good. You'd fight it if you have the ability to fight it. And of course, there are times when a guardian ad litem is necessary to protect the interests of someone who ha who truly has diminished capacity. And anyway, we, we, don't want, we don't want that system. We're blessed in New York that that isn't our system. I know there are states that still have it. I don't have the stats in my hand um, right now of what states do that. Uh, awful practice. It shouldn't happen. It should have never happened. Um, GALs just are awful. Um, what more can I say about that? I, I have a couple more things to say. Um, uh, I, I, I guess I want to, uh, how's my time? Almost over. <laughs> Um, let me let me just say, um, 
children have to have a voice in whatever form that can take. Um, and Ali clearly wasn't given a voice and uh, that's horrific. But um, in, in New York, the model at least when it's obeyed is that children do have a voice, children should have counsel, should have independent counsel, should be able to have what they're asking for, advocated for, in accordance with Rule 1.14, which I keep on coming to, because I, I think some people don't understand that a child's lawyer is actually a lawyer, um, and parents' lawyers don't always understand that. Uh, luckily in New York, I think the courts understand that, um, and I think that's really important. Let me just make sure we can, um, I'll, I'll get to say more later. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Now, Kara, I'd like to move on to you. So not only was Allie's voice not heard um, throughout the process, but those of her mother um, weren't heard as well. As an attorney who represents um, DV victims um, on custody proceedings, can you share with us what the standard is in terms of best interest and how DV impacts um, best interest? Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. And just uh, like Michael, thank you, Allie, for sharing your story um, so bravely. It's horrifying to to hear um, both just personally, but as a practitioner and someone who's uh, in and out of court <laughs> routinely and sees the impact of forced reunification efforts on children. Um, it's it's, de it's really devastating, um, but I really commend you for being here and for taking your story and making, putting power into action. So it's really impressive. Um, so in dealing with custody, the, the, the standard is what's in the best interest of the child or children. Um, there's, you know, courts really look at the totality of the circumstances, the age of the children, their expressed preferences, um, you know, depending on how old the children's the children are, you know, their preferences are given a little bit more weight depending on how, you know, the age, but that's really at the discretion of, of a judge um, and a child's willingness to actually express a preference because sometimes they don't want to express a preference and they're astute enough to, to recognize that that doing so may really put them in a in a bind, right? Or get them, you know, disfavored by one by one parent. And it's scary to to speak out. I mean, similar to what you said, Ali, you know, it's scary to think that you might take a position against against one of your parents, particularly if one of those parents is is abusive. Um, but no matter, you know, no matter what the court considers, you know, in the way that I see it often in my practice, particularly when there are allegations of domestic violence, that as soon as those come out, you're invariably hit with, oh, this is just being used uh, as a predicate to to keep the you know typically the father the father away from the children this is lies um, you know you're getting a leg up in the litigation I mean it's really children are just weaponized um, and the allegations of abuse are are largely discounted through the um, inevitable alienation claims that come as a as a consequence of that. Um, and having worked at Sanctuary for Families for, for 10 years when I first started, I mean, I saw this routinely. Um, and it, it's very, very difficult to just come, you know, constantly try to be combating that. But now that I've been in private practice and I've been in private practice for almost 10 years and I see the exact same thing and it's just now... The, the mother, is she's too perfect? Well, she's so educated. She's such a high earner. How could this possibly be true? Um, I, I have a case where the my client is an attorney and she's a very, very high earner. And that has become the narrative to combat all this. You know, judge, she's a lawyer and she's a liar. She's signing affidavits. She is a liar. Let's put her on the stand. The children are corroborating it. Um, they got forced into reunification 
And the older child said, I'm not going, you know, but she's 12 years old and her, um, you know, she just said, I'm not, I'm not doing it. And then there was a, a little seven-year-old who was getting more and more resistance such that the supervisor of the visitation couldn't even get her to transition to dad. Um, and the reunification therapist said, told all the attorneys that the seven-year-old had developed a phobia of her father and that, you know, keep pushing her and pushing her to transition to him was not was not helpful. It was actually making her regress and things and things were worse. But in the next the next day, literally the next day, she told our client to trick the seven year old and that dad was just going to show up at school and the transition would happen at school because maybe it was mom. Maybe it was mom that was making the child so fearful. And maybe if mom wasn't there to help transition the seven-year-old, all the, all the phobias, all the things she had opined about would somehow be of, of no moment. And unbelievably, last weekend, um, after we had been fighting and banging on the courthouse, literally motion after motion, talking about how dangerous he was, um, he killed himself last weekend. Um, and, you know, that to me, it was tragic. Uh, any loss of life is is tragic. And the circumstances were quite profound the way it happened. But it just resonated so much. Like no one was listening to these kids. <laughs> and it just, by the grace of God, you know, we were able to keep, you know, supervised visits in place. But I mean, what ha what would have happened if this child would have transitioned to him and he was so psychologically unstable? Um, but it's just something that, you know, it just astounds me, you know, in almost every case. And I had a case with with Michael um, where very, very young child and Michael was so unique because despite her age, he really listened. <laughs> he really listened to my client. He really tried to understand the, the nuances of what was happening and the power imbalance. And I give you an ex an really, truly, because people like you are hard to, hard to find. Um, but it's, it's very, very challenging. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Kara. Um, you know, you you said that it's about truly listening to the child, truly listening to um, the the parent, the protected uh, protecting parent, um, and any risk or safety factors that they may be sharing with the with the court. Um, judge Jolly, I want to sort of invite you into the conversation as a judge who presides over these very complex cases. Um, you have to listen to everyone. You have to listen to everyone's position and, you know, weigh in what the best interest standards are. Um, what are you looking to see attorneys do in order to help you determine best interest in these complex cases? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, first, I can't go any further without acknowledging Allie. Um, and thanking her for um, being brave enough um, and informing us of the horrific experiences she went through. Um, it's clear that the system failed you. Um, I'm hoping that those who are hearing your voice and those who will hear your voice in the future, um, especially those who practice in New York will benefit um, from what you are sharing and improve their practices if they are not working the way uh, Michael is working. Um, so I thank you very much for, for sharing your experiences. I am fortunate that I have previous experiences working um, as an attorney representing children. That's how I began my legal career in family court. Um, and like Michael, we received training on how to speak to our clients and how to um, get information from children without saying, who do you want to live with? That's not our job. That was never our job. And it's a never a position as... I think both Ali and Ms. Ballou um, referenced, you never want to put a child in that position. Um, as a judge, I can conduct in-camera hearings. 
um, and interview a child, meet with them, not ask those types of questions, not put them on the spot, and sometimes tell them, you know, if we reach that point where they're able to articulate who they spend the most time with, who they want to continue to spend the most time with, I will tell them, I will make the decision. You don't have to um, be concerned that I'm going to go out there and tell um, the lawyers that this is your position. I will incorporate that I met with you um, in my decision, and then I'll be the one to make the decision so I can be the bad guy. Um, so I take that pressure off of young people when I conduct those interviews and make sure that they understand that, that I'm not going to go out there and repeat um, what they have just discussed with me. And, and they're fortunate in that they have their attorney with them. Um, in New York, we have zealous advocacy by attorneys for children. Um, we might not have enough attorneys to represent all of the parents um, who appear in court. It's rare to not have an attorney representing a child, even a baby, um, when it's necessary. Um, and those attorneys are very zealous. So as a judge who is hearing from everyone, all the zealous advocates on the case, um, it helps me to have an attorney who is not substituting their judgment unless it's necessary, but they're advocating. Um, and if it seems as if it's a difficult position they're taking, um, they are proposing orders that should be made in place to support their client's position. Um, because when I, when I hear an attorney taking a position without um, reasonable applications to support um, that position, you know, it troubles me. So then I challenge them. Um, you know, and Ms. Ballou has already talked about you know, what we consider when we're making a decision pursuant to the domestic relations law section 70. There are various factors that you go through. Unless there is agreement by the parties about some of the issues, you know, if you're talking about physical and mental wellness, primary caretaking roles, um, there might be concession about certain things. Then we litigate the other issues. I expect attorneys to be prepared. Um, it's unfortunate right now that we have lengthy adjourned dates in between um, our court appearances, and that's mostly because of the, the pandemic and the effects that we've felt from the pandemic. So with the lengthy adjourned dates, I expect counsel to be planning and meeting and trying to address whatever the issues they can in between court dates versus them just coming in and saying, all right, let's talk about everything. When that's not fair to the family, it's just not fair to the family for uh, counsel, all counsel to raise issues for the first time, unless they're a surprise, unless they were just brought to their attention um, to other counsel. So I expect all counsel to be prepared. I expect them to exchange discovery. If we're saying that the case is ready for trial, it's ready for trial. In my part, when it's on for trial, it's on for trial, which means that you will have exchanged evidence. You will have prepared your witness, witnesses. You will have exchanged witness lists. So we know that. I think it's completely unfair to parents when I have set down what the expectation is that we're going to trial, and we don't do that. Um, unless there's an emergency, we're going to do that. Um, so I expect all attorneys to be fully prepared. I expect them to be zealous. I expect attorneys to take positions on behalf of all of their clients. I expect applications to be made for me to conduct an in-camera interview of their children. Um, I expect um, that if it's necessary, you might need a social worker. Um, if you are in an office representing children, you don't have a social worker on staff. I know Michael does, um, but there are ATB attorneys who don't have that luxury. Um, but you can submit an order and get a social worker to help you if you don't know how to interview that child, um, client of yours. Um, as a judge, I like to be challenged by the law. If you have a position that's contrary than what I'm thinking the law is, present me with the law. Um, I have no problems with that so that I can make a better informed decision and one that might end up in the in your favor. Um, but I need the law. Um, and I like to stay on top of the law, but I'm human and maybe I missed the case. You know, maybe I missed something that just happened and went to the appellate division. Um, then I expect that. I do have to say that the majority, the vast majority of the cases that we deal with in New York City Family Court, um, and there are thousands and thousands of those cases, um, parents aren't represented by um, attorneys, um, either because they're working poor and they're not necessarily eligible for assigned counsel, they're working poor and they can't afford an attorney because of um, their income, um, or we have such a tremendous shortage of attorneys on, on the panel, 
to represent parents, there might be a delay in getting attorneys to represent them. Um, so as a judge, sometimes we spend a lot of time explaining the process um, to the parents, explain to them you can't just have um, someone who saw something or heard something from someone else. You know, so we spend time discussing evidence and how you're going to be able to get this information to me. Um, and sometimes we just spend time listening to what the parents have to say, especially those who are not represented by counsel. Um, so the question was posed about how do I deal with attorneys on the case and how do I deal with best interests? Um, the other part is how do we deal with the people who are not represented by counsel and move those cases along? The actual benefit is that that child or the children are gonna end up with an attorney, which helps, which helps um, having uh, the child represented and having a lawyer on the case who can also facilitate the moving along of the case. So we do, we do that. Um, so basically I, I just, everyone should be prepared and everyone should be prepared to challenge the judge who is hearing the case with the law because that's what we're bound by. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Jolly. You're welcome. Um, Joan, I now want to turn to you. Um, you mentioned court's emphasis on shared parenting, gender bias, and misconceptions about abuse as recognized explanations for why mothers' claims of abuse are so widely denied in court. In addition, you've also mentioned another less recognized contributor, um, unconscious psychological denial, also referred to as unconscious denial or psychological denial. Can you explain what that means? Sure. And I just want to clarify, Angela, um, that discussion isn't in the in the study, but it is in my latest article that came out in Georgetown Law Journal, where I talk both about the study and, and more about why I speculate and I think and others think the trends are what they are. Um, so yes, in that article, I um, I put put forth what I think is kind of a new new art new a new hypothesis um, as to courts' resistance to accepting abuse claims and acting accordingly, and that is the idea of psychological denial. And I um, I draw from the literature that actually looks at. Um, denial of the sort that happened during the Holocaust with countries near concentration camps or towns near concentration camps um, where there was sort of a sense that something might be wrong, but there was a very strong desire not to know. Um, there has been the same analysis done around um, uh, what happens in autocratic countries where uh, people are disappeared and tortured um, and the rest of the society is kind of going about its business. There's a need to not know because to know is intolerable. And um, and then I move into the, the really brilliant writing of Judith Herman who wrote the book Trauma and Recovery. She's a psychiatrist at Harvard. Um, and she talks a lot about um, uh, the society's need to not know about the war at home. She talks about the, you know, PTSD for, for war veterans. And then she says, but there, there's a war at home between men and women and society needs to not know. She says it much better than I'm saying it. So, so basically this idea of psychological denial and needing to not know has been applied in both domestic violence and non-domestic violence settings. And I think particularly when it comes to child sexual abuse, which is for our culture and probably most cultures, one of the most heinous things to contemplate. Um, especially in interpersonal relations. Um, it is just too awful. And we have a very strong pr internal protection and defense against knowing about that. So I'm positing that some of what's going on, especially in child sexual abuse cases, is the need to not know this kind of psychological denial. It's not judges saying, oh, great, send the kid to the rapist. It's judges saying, um, well, there's all these reasons to not believe it, so I'm going to choose to to go that way because to believe it is too hard for me to handle. And and I don't mean by saying this, I don't mean to really be putting down judges. I think anyone who uh, would have to hear this kind of information and would have to potentially um, accept this kind of reality day in and day out in a large caseload, it's 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 asking an awful lot of any human being. Um, I think there's a way that the system could be structured to make it more possible. There, there could be not only training on vicarious trauma and, and denial, but um, support for judges and other professionals who are immersed in trauma material 
day in and day out and aren't being given the kind of support that this conference is giving to its attendees and, and participants around what it does to us to be immersed in this material. And one of the things it does to us is that we, we, we reject it, you know, especially if we're forced into it all the time. It's just like, no, it can't be true. And we find a lot of reasons to believe it's not true. So, uh, you know, I think that's human. I think that's understandable. And I think we need to step up and recognize the depth of difficulty of this material. Thank you, Joan. And I also think that oftentimes it's hard to reconcile what you're seeing in court in terms of presentation with what's being alleged. So you have somebody that's, you know, we know that people that tend to cause harm are very skilled at manipulation and the way that they present in court. And so looking at the way that the person is presenting versus all these allegations um, that are being um, hurled at them, it's really hard to, to make that switch. Um, and for you, Allie, I always find it so fascinating that what your claims were in terms of, you know, being abused by your father were being denied or discounted or not believed by so many people, but your father's allegations of parental alienation without any type of proof um, was what they chose to latch on. Why do you think that is? Do you, did your father present a certain way? Yeah, uh, definitely. So my father, um, definitely it was partly in how he presented himself. He always looked very capable and, and sympathetic, and he definitely manipulated um, all of the court officials into, um, you know, believing that he was a victim of my mom. Um, and an, another thing is that the people who did believe my abuse, there were several therapists who, who did, but they were afraid to speak up in court because they wanted to continue getting clients from the court. Um, so that was definitely a, a big problem. Um, but I think also something that plays a major role is that, like what Joan was saying, the court wanted to believe him. Um, it was easier to blame my mom uh, rather than admit that they had been wrong and endanger my and endangered my sister and myself. Um, you know, I hadn't really considered the psychological aspect of it for for the judges um, before, but I'm sure that that also played a role. And then, definitely, I think I saw this more with like our case manager and, and guardian ad litem. But like this willful willful ignorance was partially driven by greed as well. I think Joan mentioned earlier that these reunification therapies and camps are huge money makers um, for a lot of people. And so I think, you know, the longer we're kept in court, the longer we're going through these camps and reunification therapy, the more money that people made. So, yeah. Thank you. Talk to us a little bit more about these reunification camps. Are they nationwide? Yes, absolutely they are. So, I mean, there's even one here in New York in Long Island run by Linda Gottlieb. Um, and, but, you know, I mean, I was taken from Kansas to Montana. And um, so family bridges, especially, they just go and set up shop in any hotel or um, motel, anything like that. Um, they actually do that to flout um, laws because they can't technically um, be operating as a as therapy because their owner, Randy Rand, actually um, lost his license in 2012, um, his psychological his psychologist license. Um, and so they really just set up shops so that they can flout these regulations and everything like that. Um, but, you know, like Linda Gottlieb's camp, not much better. Um, yeah, it's all about threat therapy and, and it's nationwide. So yeah, it's definitely important for judges and child advocates and lawyers to um, understand the what these camps are possible, what these camps make possible for abusers. So yeah, thank you. Kara, I want to turn the conversation to you. Um, in your practice, when you have a client who discloses child abuse um, by the other parent, what if what, if anything, do you do or need to consider before even raising it in court? And how do you prepare a client for the possible backlash that could come out of this? 
So it really depends on what the allegation is. Um, and not only what the allegation is, but it depends sort of looking really at the totality of the case. Who's our judge? Who's on the other side? Or is there an attorney for the child? And if there is, you know, how involved are they? How willing are they to, you know, really kind of get involved? Um, and if there is no attorney for the child, then we really look at, okay, well, how can this allegation be sort of vetted and brought to the surface by someone other than mom, right? Because we are always know that if mom raises it, it's going to largely be looked at with skepticism and it may just entirely be discounted and then weaponized um, against her. So, you know, that it may involve, you know, talking with the attorney for the child. On every case that I'm on where there's an attorney for the child, I really make try to make that relationship really, really strong so that I have a good working relationship with that attorney um, and that my client feels like they have access to that person um, so that we can really sometimes it involves kind of back channeling, you know, hey, I need to talk to you about something and try to feel that person out. You know, really, again, it really depends on what what is the allegation. Um, but if we don't have an attorney for a child on the case, then, you know, maybe it's something that goes to the therapist. Maybe it's something that you take to a pediatrician. I mean, you have to always keep in mind that pediatricians, therapists, they're, they're mandated reporters. So, you know, you, you take an allegation to, to someone like that and it could get reported, you know, you can sort of lose control of how to manage uh, manage the allegation. Sometimes in some situations, that's a good thing. Other times that can really hurt your client um, and it could potentially hurt, hurt your case. So it's sort of a hard thing to answer. Um, but in, in any case where it's mine, I just try to be exceedingly strategic and thoughtful about, you know, what we're going to do with the allegation. You know, sometimes clients, understandably, they want you to act immediately. They want it to be, you know, brought to the surface immediately. And that's not always the best thing for them. That's not always the best thing for the case. And importantly, it's not always the best thing for, for the child. Um, so I try to keep that sort of strategic focus you know, at every at every stage of the case, because the last thing you want to see happen is that the allegation gets, you know, it gets away from you um, and you can't then unring the bell. And it's very, very hard um, to kind of constantly have to fight against the inevitable, you know, this is a lie, you're using this as a weapon. Um, this is just being used as a pretext to keep dad away from from the children. Um, so really trying to be thoughtful about how you, you know, bring those allegations to the surface, I think is incredibly important. And it's there's so many mixed messages sent to client because on the other hand, you know, if you don't protect your child, you're at risk of losing your child. But then when you seek to take steps to do it, you also have to deal with how it could possibly affect your case and you being able to retain custody of your child too. Michael, what about you? Uh, how do you address um, parental alienation claims when they're raised in your cases? I think it's through trying to get as much information as you can. So uh, of course I want my client's view, but I also wanna know what, what both parents are saying. Uh, I also have to keep in mind that the vast majority of the claims that are made by someone who's been accused of causing harm are false. So um, I go in with that, with that knowledge. Not that I'm, I'm still, I still want to listen, right? Because I might have the one case where it actually is true, right? Where there's been, where there's been harm to my client caused by the primary caregiver. That's the, that's the aberration, not the norm for sure. So I, I think, I think the quick answer to that is. Uh, get as much information as possible from everyone, of course, primarily my client, but find out what both parents have to say. Um, and keep in mind that that uh, my client's story is the story I want. The, the other thing about that when working with children is making sure that I'm actually getting my client's story is not always the easiest thing. So uh, 
how I, I get, I, this is a pandemic era uh, problem too with remote interviews. Uh, luckily we're, we're returning to in-person interviews whenever we can for our, for our clients, except when our clients are older and don't want to come in, <laughs> uh, which happens, right? Uh, love working with teens. Uh, <laughs> but um, I mean, uh, you want to interview kids uh, in a place where they have privacy, where they can speak freely. Uh, another uh, ad for always working with, uh, with expert social workers. You want to always be, uh, have that backup. Um, and I'm lucky that I'm working with social workers who are expert also in intimate partner violence. So it's a it's a it's definitely what you want. You want to have as much information as you can. You also want to get to know your client as well as you can, so your client can actually feel like they can open up to you, which is a challenge. And it's it's been more of a challenge during pandemic era where it's really hard to see folks in person. It makes a really big difference, especially with with younger kids, Zoom interviews for a three-year-old, you know, I'm not, I'm not really going to get much, even with the best social worker in the world, which is <laughs> the folks I work with. Um, no offense to any other social workers in the room, I'm so, sure also are awesome. But I mean, I think it's uh, as much time as you can, as much opportunity to hear your client's voice uh, is, and uh, also making sure you can hear what both, both parents have to say, but also be alert for, for why they're saying particular things and also being trained on um, the dynamics of domestic violence and truly being able to understand what that could pre what that can look like in family dynamics as well to yeah. help you gather and, that information. And keeping those wheels in your mind, right? So using children post-separation wheel, you've all seen it, I hope. Um, uh, not to only talk about the negative wheels, there's, there's some awesome positive wheels out there too. Uh, keep those on my wall, the positive ones. Um, and, and I think I think keeping those factors in mind is really important. So Judge Jolly, you have a really hard um, job in terms of assessing credibility and differentiating between an actual allegation of alienation versus a parent who is protecting their child from abuse or where the child is just reacting to the abusive parent's behavior, especially when you're dealing with an imperfect um, protective parent. How do you address that? Sure. I just wanna say there are no perfect parents. Right? There are no, <laughs> no perfect parents. And, and, and as, as a judge, um, maybe it's more from personal experience, but reality is um, as I'm dealing with cases, I'm not looking for perfection. There is no way that any person, um, this, that's an unrealistic expectation um, for people to think that. I have to say that what I'm grateful for is being a judge in New York City um, and in the state of New York, um, because we are fortunate to have Family Violence Task Force, which began its work in 1994. Um, and, and the purpose of the task force is to ensure that every judge, every justice, support magistrate, referee, a court attorney, anyone who, cler clerical staff, anyone who comes into contact um, with family violence issues, that they be well-versed about those issues. The Family Violence Task Force um, conducts semi-annual trainings about all issues that relate to domestic violence. And I'll tell you a few of the topics. They do include, um, uh, avoiding, sorry, the traps of the single theory, single theory of parental alienation, addressing domestic violence on children uh, as it relates to appellate decisions, um, litigating custody and visitation in this world uh, in which we're dealing with domestic violence, assessing risk to children in domestic violence cases, matching conditions to risk and issuing orders of protection, unfair assumptions, um, implicit and explicit bias in domestic violence cases. Um, when judges are new, to the unified court system, there's training provided by the Judicial Institute. When judges are newly assigned to the New York City Family Court, we do additional training. We go to great lengths to make sure that as we interview support magistrates and court attorney referees, that they understand the issues that revolve around domestic violence and that they are present um, in, in some of the cases that they deal with. We coordinate with the Center for Court Innovation 
Um, and we recently had a class of support magistrates and court attorney referees. Um, and the issues that were involved in that training were dynamics of domestic violence, trauma and vicarious trauma, and access to justice and implicit bias issues. I just want to respond to Professor Meyer, who talked about judges who are doing this work on a regular basis and how they are dealing with vicarious trauma, we offer training um, and awareness sessions for judges, for well, the jurists, um, clerical staff. You know, our clerical staff are sitting with people as they assist them with the drafting of family offense petitions, um, as they deal with custody petitions and application support. Um, when someone is trying to get that order, that initial order, and they're been unsuccessful, but they've made it to the courthouse or they're on the phone with them. Um, we provide wellness support, um, definitely for our jurists, um, and we're working on improving um, wellness support for our clerical staff. Um, we talk about bias on a regular basis. We're fortunate to have our Deputy Chief Administrative Judge for Justice Initiatives, who is leading us in our charge relating to equal justice. Um, and so there's a lot of work that we are doing to support our judges. Uh, and so with all of that training that is required um, for all of the judges, non-judicial staff, um, that's a step in being aware of um, domestic violence, um, the control issues. Um, so as, as, as a judge managing and processing all of these issues, clearly it's easier if there are lawyers on the case because the lawyers will have subpoenaed maybe that pediatrician. They will have subpoenaed um, the police reports and gotten that information much more challenging um, for individuals who are unrepresented to get that information. But we direct them a bit to tell them, listen, you're going to need some proof uh, in order to support the claims that you were making because I have to process evidence. That's what I have to um, process. I still, I'm going to stress again, the court conducts in-camera interviews of, of young people. Um, and part of, for me, the training comes from having been an attorney for children and the additional training comes from what's offered through the, the Family Violence Task Force and what the Judicial Institute offers. We, as, as a judge, I have to assess credibility, which can be challenging, but in the context of all the trainings we receive through the Family Violence Task Force and Judicial Institute, you understand that maybe if someone is not consistent in their testimony and they're a victim of domestic violence, that might be why, um, but you have to have that, that foundation and understanding about that and not just make a determination that person, because they're looking away, make this automatic assumption that they must be lying, that she must be lying uh, about what is going on. So it really is a matter of making sure that you're educated, you continue to be educated um, and have advocates before you who are fully educated as well um, about all the issues that revolve around domestic violence and interpartner um, violence. So it's, it's a matter of juggling and assessing credibility and the evidence that is presented to the court. And again, as I said, it's a little bit more challenging when we're dealing with individuals who are unrepresented and most grateful if there's an attorney representing um, the child. And then hopefully we'll get more attorneys on the 18B panel to represent parents. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a less challenging process for the parents. Thank you, Judge Jolly. Um, Kara and Michael, in terms of practical ad advice, what is one piece of practical advice you would give to practitioners um, who have to deal with some of these complex parental alienation claims in their cases? <laughs> Briefly. <laughs> I mean, I think it comes down to having as much of the, as much time as you can to to try to figure out what what's closest to true, um, and getting as much information as you can. And the word I had in my notes was rapport, rapport building with my client, uh, figuring out more about my client's wishes and interests, and uh, and just getting as much information as possible. Um, the other thing, maybe uh, say one thing is. Uh, as time goes on, you get to see the parties in court, so you can learn a lot from, and if you're lucky to be in a courtroom where the parties wait actually in the room while you're waiting for the case to be heard, you can actually learn a lot from those moments too. So it's all, I, I think it's all um, information. I don't know if that was the uh, very good responsive answer. <laughs> Kara, maybe. Um, no, I mean, I think be tenacious and constantly reframe the allegation. 
Um, just because your client has concerns doesn't mean that they're trying to alienate their children from their abusive mother. Um, and giving voice to those concerns and not being not being scared or timid to do that, even if you're just being attacked um, from the other side. Because I do think that the more the court hears that, that it starts to sink in, you know, whether it's completely far, far afield or, or not. So if you don't have the counter voice in the room to constantly be attacking against it and to be constantly reframing it and reframing the very, very legitimate concerns of your of your client, um, then the alienation claims will will start to resonate with with the court very, very unfairly. Um, so I think tenacity is what I would say. <laughs> And, and Joan, um, based on your research, what do you think as advocates um, we can do in terms of finding a solution? Well, I would just add to what's been said that um, we often advise people to get, an ex get a counter expert to deconstruct the alienation expert and to show why their report or their analysis is not valid. And take what, what Michael's describing, take all that information and point out in an authoritative expert report that this information shows that alienation is not what's going on. It shows that. So I, I think it's pretty hard to counter, at least around the country. Again, I don't know New York City. I have dealt with some uh, uh, Westchester type cases in New York where all the same things were going on that I've seen around the country. Um, but um, it's pretty hard to counter the alienation <laughs> line, um, even if you are a good advocate, if you don't have someone at a sort of expert level to challenge the ex this supposedly expert opinion about alienation, um, if it's coming from, a, from an evaluator or a GAL or another expert, if it's just coming from a litigant, then I agree completely with what Kara and Michael had to say. Um, you might be okay without an expert. So that's one thing as a litigator. I mean, generally, systemically, um, you know, I've been working on this for, for over 10 years, trying to get the system to, to, to recognize that alienation cropped up as a way of denying abuse. I mean, this is, not, this is not a theory that developed in psychotherapy or developed in child development. It developed in the context of litigation to deny child sexual abuse and eventually was, you know, applied more broadly. And then it has been refined endlessly and made into a cottage industry. It's not, it's not a thing that stands on its own two feet. It's a thing that was designed as a way to deny abuse claims. And that is not the only way it's used. And obviously, as my research shows, there are other claims of alienation that aren't about abuse. But when it's used in the context of abuse claims, um, it courts should be suspicious of them, uh, of alienation claims that are used in the context of abuse. And you know, I think the best way to help a court be suspicious is to bring an expert on board to do the trainings that counteract the pro-alienation trainings that are so ubiquitous, et cetera. Thank you, Joan. So now I have to do my spiel on the conference code. So for attorneys <laughs> participating in this program remotely, please note the MCLE passcode is 3228. This code must be included on your MCLE form to submit for credit. And before we move into the Q&A section, I just want to give Ali um, the last word. Ali, what would you like for the audience to take away from your experience? Um, yeah, I think the main thing really is that, um, you know, I was never heard throughout my whole court case over like 10, 12 years. Um, so definitely kids need a voice. And I think Michael is definitely doing a really good job um, at giving kids voices. So <laughs> that's great. Um, but, you know, really no treatment or court order should ever be able to completely cut off contact with a safe and loving parent unless there's, you know, evidence of substantial abuse. And um, so I think that that's definitely really important and something that people should know about this. <laughs> yeah. We'll move into the Q&A. Hi, everyone. Thank you to all of our distinguished speakers. The first question is for Judge Jali. Can you uh, speak to what seems to be the prevailing trend in New York of 50-50 custody awards? 
I'm not sure that's the trend in New York City family court. Um, I can only speak about my experiences and I have not seen this trend that it's 50-50. I, I'm at a disadvantage because I don't know that data and I can't speak for matrimonial proceedings. I can speak about family court. Um, and I think that the judges and the referees who are managing these cases are going through the factors um, that are necessary. Unless counsel are agreeing, um, all counsel are agreeing to this type of an outcome, there has to be a hearing and determinations based upon the various factors and the evidence that's presented. So I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think that there's an automatic 50-50 a view that is taken um, when managing the cases. I think there are some people who come, if they're unrepresented, they think and present to the court um, that it should be 50-50. Um, and I think that the court, I can't speak for the whole court, I speak for myself. As I explained, there are various factors I have to consider, including where the child lives before these proceedings, how old is the child, you know, who provides the primary care, you know, all of that. So it's not an absolute decision that the mother's going to automatically get custody because that's where the child lived before the case was filed. Um, and it doesn't mean that it's going to be automatic for the father, um, if that's the situation as well. And I tell them it has to be a hearing. I often tell people, um, of course, we're not talking about cases with domestic violence. I tell them it'd be better if you were able to try to resolve the case on your own. I try to make referrals for mediation. Of course, if there's domestic violence, we don't send those cases um, uh, for mediation, um, even though I think there should be some trained professionals um, in the future and down the road who understand the dynamics of domestic violence, who are properly trained to provide a tool um, to the parent who is the victim of domestic violence when they are ready and clearly, I think if they are uh, have counsel, um, because they have to maintain this relationship with this person through the life of their their child. Um, so every hearing, there's a case, there's a hearing conducted in every case. Uh, might be abbreviated, might not be, but I don't approach the cases as if they need to be 50-50. Can I say one thing to that? Um, I've never hated math more than I've hated math since I've worked on custody cases. But I also think math is incredibly telling. And there's so many times where, especially early in the case, but throughout a case, there'll be one parent, it's, it's always the person who's alleged to have caused the harm, who is insisting on a property right. And um, when Ali was speaking, you were talking about at one point a 60-40 split, then a 50-50 split. And every time I hear those numbers, I'm thinking, we're not talking about property. And I think, um, I think it's really uh, important when people talk about, um, when parents or parents' lawyers start talking about math and start talking about the percent of time they have. Um, that you start, in my mind, I have to tell you, that immediately sets up alarm bells that, that, that I'm dealing with a parent who is talking about their property and not about an independent, amazing child. And, and I just had to say that. I'm so glad I had the chance to say that. Uh, I, I was, um, I thank you, but I, I would, um, I'm, I'm going to go to court today and someone will talk about math. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Uh, for Michael. How would you handle a case where an older child, say over the age of 10, expresses a preference to live with the abusive parent? Oh, well, um, after I find out that that's really their preference, I'm obligated to advocate for what they want. Although again, look at rule 1.14 and see what my exceptions are. And also I should tell you, I work with uh, uh, experienced uh, MSWs uh, who uh, are mandated reporters. So they're independent professionals that I'm that I'm lucky enough to get to work with. So they are so they're mandated reporters. So I need to put that out there. My clients also know that. We tell them, you know, when we talk about what confidentiality is, we talk about what the exceptions are. But I, I think uh, the, the first thing is um, unless there's an exception to the rule, I'm advocating for what they want. <coughs> Ali, can you speak to the the relationship you have with with each of your parents today? Of course. So um, with my mom, I I actually see her every other weekend. She comes up to New York and we have a clinic because they're um, my parents are ophthalmologists. Um, and so the, I have a great relationship with her. She's always been very supportive of me um, and, and in speaking out as well. Um, and I do not talk to my father today. Um, you know, I think that if he had not escalated everything as far as he did and he had 
shown that he wanted to put my sister and I before, you know, his control, um, his want for control, I think that we would be in a different place. But yeah, I mean, everything that he did really, really threw that out the window. Um, for Judge Jolly, uh, do you believe that in-camera proceedings should happen early on in the proceedings or as a last resort? It's never a last resort. It depends on the application made by the attorney for the child. Um, they're usually the ones who will raise, if it's earlier than trial, um, it's usually the application that's made by the attorney for the child. Um, I trust that that attorney has met with their client, interviewed them um, on more than one occasion and made this decision um, to make the application for an in-camera interview. It depends. If we're talking about we haven't yet gotten to the final custody determination and we're dealing with access um, by one of the parents or both of the parents and it's necessary, then yeah, um, I'll engage in that in-camera as, as often as it's necessary, but also make sure it's not, you know, traumatic for the child. You know, sometimes they feel as if they're going to the doctor's office and that's not always, you know, my apologies to any doctors, but you know, it's not always a pleasant experience <laughs> going to the doctor um, for not just children, right? So when they're coming in to see me, you don't want to make it as comfortable as possible, not wear my robe, you know, try to engage in, you know, light, conversation before we get into things. It, it takes a while. Um, and sometimes it is necessary to do more than one in-camera interview because they haven't, even if you spend an hour with them, they're not yet comfortable and that's okay. You know, you can't force that relationship. Michael talks about, you know, building a relationship and having a social worker. I have experience interviewing children, so I, I rely on that. But I also recognize it might not be as they say one and done. Um, so I might need to have the child come back at another occasion when they don't have school. We're not thinking about their after school activities that I've taken them away from, you know, and they're, they're very unhappy about that. So I have to process all of that. Tara, what do you do um, when you're advising a, a protective parent in a, in a situation with with AFC's attorneys for the children who are not up to Michael's standard, <laughs> <laughs> and who are not trained in DV, not, not really interested in engaging with the child and, and who tend to side with the abusive parent. Uh, um, I know Michael mentioned earlier that the GAL system is, is deeply flawed and I'm inclined to agree in, in theory that it's better to have an AFC, but I'm sure I'm not the only one in this room who's had to deal with some terrible AFCs. Yeah, so that's a good question, and it's it's com it's complicated. It doesn't have really an easy answer. Um, but I think part of it is educating your your client about how to express the concerns that that she has, um, and really really focusing on framing them as concerns as opposed to just bashing the other parent um, and really try if you you know I try to really sit with my client and and really hear what what are like what are really the concerns and of your litany of 10 things you know what is the most compelling and then how can we frame that so that this attorney for the child who maybe has not been very receptive to you hasn't heard you know is you know discounting what the kids are, are saying, um, how can we make it resonate and how can we make it palatable to, to him or her? Um, and sometimes that involves, you know, me sitting down with the attorney for the child on my own first and trying to, you know, frame the issue a little bit, you know, preview it for them, then bringing my client in. I tend to like to <clears throat> meet with my client and the AFC together. Um, when I'm not there, I find that what I hear from the attorney versus what I hear from my client, sometimes they're, they're different enough that it leaves me thinking, okay, what like what really happened? Because um, obviously everybody takes away something different um, even from the same conversation. So I think it's really about just trying to manage that relationship. Um, with the attorney for the child, and then manage the communication and how the and how the concerns are are raised. Uh, Professor Maya, we had a question as to whether your study 
examine the average age of the children at all? No, we did not. I think that data was not clear enough in the opinions for us to, you know, system systematically log it. I just have have one more question, and I guess anyone can can take it. And that is, how do you how do you get judges to use findings from a family offense proceeding or in order, the fact that there's an order of protection as as relevant in custody? Um, because sometimes we have these experiences where um, there's an order of protection and then the judge will move on to custody as as if the coercive control is just stopping because there's an order of protection. I don't know who wants to take that. That's a factor in custody. Let the judge yeah. see it. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, Michael. Go ahead, Michael. You can finish you, now. I think we're, we're going to say the same thing, I think. Maybe. I think we are. Uh, although you were going to say it eloquently. Um, <laughs> just that it's, it's a factor in the custody determination. It has to be. Uh, domestic violence is a mandated factor. Judge, is that what you were going to say? That's exactly what I was going to say. You can't move on to the custody and sometimes even the visitation and access issue until you've addressed um, the, the family offense matter. And if there's a finding and then there's an issuance of a final order of protection, you know, and, and there's been testimony in history, it can't be disregarded by the court. It should not be disregarded by the court. And if you believe it's being disregarded, then as an advocate, you have to remind the judge of their obligation as to what they need to consider, um, either in your presentation of proof, um, in, through your client's testimony, and then in your summation, you know, remind the court. Um, and then fortunately there are safe, not safeguards in place, but if the judge has made the wrong decision, we have the appellate division to remind us of what we should have considered um, in issuing that order, not disregarding domestic violence and, and violence. May I add one, one thought on this topic? Sure. Um, I, again, uh, around the country, it's been a pitched battle on whether custody judges have to um, admit evidence, past evidence of domestic violence. It's, it's something that seems so obvious to all of us as a matter of common sense, as well as statutory law. Courts often try to exclude that stuff and say it was already adjudicated, so I don't have to consider it now, or, or, or it's in the past, there was an order, but it was two years ago, and now we're here. So, um, you know, the exclusion of, of Evidence of domestic violence is, you know, something again that a lot of courts do around the country, and I think it's probably partly for the reasons I've described. They don't want to be dealing with that in in the custody setting, um, and of course, it defeats shared custody if that's a high value for for, for courts, which it is in in a lot of cases. Um, but uh, it's it's a more contested question than than I think Judge Jolly's very <coughs> refreshing perspective <laughs> suggests. I also want to add that, you know, in support matters, our support magistrates receive the, the registry checks um, on all of their cases. So they have to process that information as they're making the decision. So they may not have been told by one of the parties that there's the existing order of protection. Um, but when a magistrate gets the result of that registry check, they have to factor that in and consider who do I have before me more than just the presentation of you know, the, the numbers, as Michael was saying, which I can't do in support, not my thing, but it's more than just numbers as you're dealing with support. And going back to the 50-50 question, when I hear 50-50, I think, oh, this person who's raising it, it's got child support in the back of their mind. Um, or if they're really pushing that they want 100%, they never had um, the child in the care, there's support in the back of my mind as a little checklist. Is this what we're really talking about? So this concludes our panel. Thank you all for participating. I want to yeah, I want to say thank you to Judge Jolly, Tara, Michael, and Allie, and thank you to the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much. This gave us so much to think about. Um, I'm really pleased the way the themes are coming together. I think we saw a lot of the themes from yesterday regarding under, better understanding of lethality and lethality factors and how those 
are not just for an order of protection case. Those are for a custody case also that we hope that all judges are getting trained on understanding um, some of these warning signs, uh, which Kara, um, I really was so moved by your story of your recent case um, and how scary that that really is. Um, and obviously connects yesterday. I see Jacqueline's still sitting here too. What we heard about yesterday with regard to um, you know, some of the worst things that happened. So thank you all for bringing together those themes. Um, yesterday, we also heard about gender bias by Judge Ellerin in the gender 2020 gender study. And we heard today from Joan Meyer about how um, these um, allegations of domestic violence are just not being not being credited. And why is that? And is that gender bias? So I'm so I'm so glad that these themes have been raised and we can think about how how all these things um, blend together, knit together. Um, fortunately, my job isn't to to then know what the answer to that is, <laughs> but 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 I'm I'm seeing the themes and I'm I'm glad that we're seeing them. Um, and with regard to uh, the cottage industry that was discussed, and um, fortunately, it's not hugely prevalent, but there is reunification um, therapy happening in New York. It is a growing um, industry, and we heard in, on the Blue Ribbon Forensics Commission about the cottage industry of forensic evaluators and uh, the ways in which uh, there is self-dealing. And we heard testimony um, in the hearings for the Blue Ribbon Commission from parents who who talked about the fact that uh, their counsel or opposing counsel had a relationship with um, the forensic evaluators, <laughs> and particularly upstate. I think that's not as much of an issue that I've heard about down here, but there were several people from north of the city who talked about that. So, um, and then finally, I can't help but, and I would love to have been on this panel, but I can't help but think about, um, I have a case in which um, the son who, who visibly observed for years his father having relationships with young women and in fact um, purchasing women and, and having pretty much being like a pimp. And he used the word trafficker. And he was, uh, I think, about 13 years old. He's on the internet. He knows things. He's seen it happen before his own eyes. And the attorney for the child said, well, the mom must be alienating the child and must be putting this idea in his head because how could a child know that? And I'm thinking, this kid saw a lot. <laughs> this kid knew and you know, so the attorney for the child, unfortunately, this is a current case, um, is is not always. Um, and yes, we love Michael. We wish we want Michael actually to just train AFCs and and ATVs who serve as AFCs around the state. That's a suggestion. Anyway, so uh, I'll I'll end there with I'm sorry. I I get the podium. I get to take the podium. So I get to put my two cents in sometimes, um, even though I was never a panelist um, in this in this conference. But thank you all. Uh, we are going to take a break. Um, until 11.15, uh, and our next panel will be at 11.15, and so thanks, everyone.